I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, just fine, thank you. Remember last week it was my girlfriend Diane's birthday? Oh, yes, yes. Well, she was very happy to know we spoke about it, and so was her father. Is he nice? Mm, mostly nice. Well, just what do you mean by mm, mostly? Well, he likes to think that he's a comedian, like Bob Hope, you know. His name is Bob, too. Mm. And all the time he's making wise cracks. And sometimes they're funny, but sometimes they're... Not as funny as he thinks they are. Oh. Uh, tell me, what do you do when he's not so funny? We laugh anyway, so he doesn't feel bad. Oh, I think that's very nice. And speaking of birthdays, this week it's the birthday of George Washington. Yes, sir. He was the father of our country. That's right. And, and then, would it be right if I would say George Washington was my great, great, great grandfather? Well, I don't think the Washington Monument would object, so go right ahead. Thank you. Now, now, please read me the funny. Puck the Comic Weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. In an attempt to solve the mystery of all the crimes that have been committed in the town of Buckskin, Hoppy has chased a mysterious stranger into the storeroom of the freight company. Suddenly there was a shot. The man dropped dead in front of him. And the gun was tossed through the window on the floor in front of Hoppy. As Hoppy picked it up, a bunch of men ran into the freight office and found Hoppy there before the dead man holding the smoking pistol in his hand. As one of the citizens holds the gun on Hoppy, another accuses him of the killing. Hoppy replies... Yes, I admit chasing this man here, but I didn't kill him. Somebody outside that window fired a shot and tossed his gun into the room. I picked it up just as you barged in. The leader of the men replies, Yeah, very pretty speech, when it still adds up to murder. And pointing to the man lying in front of him, he goes on, last picture, top row. Captain Reed was one of the best officers the Texas Rangers ever had. Hoppy replies sharply, Are the Rangers usually in the habit of ambushing people? And as the citizens of the town stand outside of the office listening, first picture, next row, the man answers, No, and they're not in the habit of driving stolen rigs or herding Russell cattle out of Bar 20 Lane. We've been following you since you hit town, waiting for you to make a slip. Too bad we had to lose Reed to get you. And then he says, last picture, second row, Your luck's run out, Cassidy. You're coming with us. And as Hoppy is prodded with a gun, a rough-looking, bearded man says, Oh, uh, I'll stay behind to make the final arrangements for poor Reed. Hoppy is led out of the building. First picture, bottom row, the men mount horses. And under heavy guard, Hoppy is led from the town in disgrace. (laughs) Meanwhile, inside the building, the bearded man, who was looking out of the window, says, All clear, Captain. They've gone. And Captain Reed who has just been pretending he was dead, gets to his feet, saying, Well, that's a relief. I couldn't have held that pose another minute. Last picture, the bearded man says, Ah, you played it great. We got Cassidy and a pickle. Looking out of the window, the captain replies, Yeah, well, that was the idea. We'll wait till the street's deserted, then slip out of here. There's more work to do. Yes, it was. It was just a trick to get Hoppy in disgrace in front of the people in town. That means that none of them will, will fight for Hoppy if those other men try to kill him. Well, it looks that way because these men have succeeded in making all the people in town think that Hoppy's a murderer. Yes. Now, what do you think that they'll do to Hoppy? Well, we'll find more about that next week. 
Now? Now could we please turn over the page and see if Prince Valiant is we there? We certainly can. Let's turn over the page to page three. And here he is, Prince Val. Yes, look, and they're still having a terrible time in that flood. Yes, Val and Arf and a guide had gone on a hunting trip and it had begun to rain. And it just poured down rain until the rivers were rushing and roaring. They were still filled with water. And as Prince Val and his friends were crossing the river, a great big tree carried by the flood came at them so swiftly they didn't have time to get out of its way. And it crashed into them and knocked over their horses. And then Val and Arf disappeared under the water. Yes, the guide was the only one who was safe. So please read so we can find out what happens to Val and Arf. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> The guide searches the foaming cataract for some sign of Prince Valiant or Arf. But who could survive such thundering power? And then the guide arises wearily and begins the long journey home. No sooner had he turned his back on the roaring waterfall than a clutching hand reaches from out of the foam, and Val swings his battered body into an eddy and drags himself from the water. <coughs> For a long moment, he rests, filling his tortured lungs with life-giving air. As he sits there, gasping for breath, he sees, last picture top row, the mass of debris that has brought disaster run aground, turn over, bringing Arf to the surface amid its tangle. Quickly, crossing over on the stones, Val is beside Arf in a moment, getting him out of the debris, first picture next row. At this moment, Arf regains consciousness. From one of their drowned horses, Val takes a saddle blanket then carries Arf away from the river and puts him underneath an overhanging ledge formed by a huge boulder that is resting upon another. Second picture, second row. Then Val goes in search of materials for a fire. Birch bark will burn wet or dry. So into a roll of this, he gathers the dry twigs to be found close to the trunk of a thick spruce. First picture, bottom row. A few dry leaves found in the shelter of their cave adds to the pile of tinder. With his striking iron, Val chips a spark from his flint. And then last picture, in the growing darkness, they coax the small flame into a roaring fire that Val hopes will steam the chill from his companion. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? That Val is safe and that he saved us? Oh, gee. Yes. It's and, and, and wasn't it wonderful how he made that fire, just like a Girl Scout? Yeah, so you see, sometimes it's very important to know how to do these things. That's right, because something like this could happen to people like us. It could. Nature's such a wild thing, you never know might, what might happen. Your car might get stranded in a rainstorm, and then you'd have to make a fire yourself. Yeah. I wonder if Val will get home next week. Well, next week we'll find out about that. Now? Oh, there's so many I like to read. Let's just turn over the page and, and see what we come to. All right, let's turn over the page. Go past page four. Go across past page five. Turn over that page. Oh, look, here's Donald Duck. Turn over another page. No, no, no. This is Donald Duck. Read that, please. Oh, excuse me. Very well. We shall read Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me, please. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squid a chicken chat. Let's have music to play the quack quack. Today, Donald and his nephews, Huey, Huey, and Louie, have been out for a drive in their car, and the car engine has died. After a half hour trying to make it start, Donald finally says, Oh, I give up. It won't start. Then he heads down the road saying, Come on, I think I saw a garage back here away. They get to the garage and Donald hammers on the door. And he hammers again. Finally, a window is opened. And the garage owner in his nightshirt sticks his head out of the window and says, Okay, I'll come out in the morning and pull you in. Now scram! And he slams the window shut. Donald doesn't know what to do. Louie says... But see, we can't stand out here all night. And Huey says... Hey, look at Donald. I see a motel sign up there. So down the road they go to the motel. Last picture, top row. They pass four dog houses. 
And then... First picture, bottom row, the motel owner opens the door and points to a sign saying, No rooms! Can't you read? Try the hotel! At the hotel, the clerk says, We're full up and no loafing in the lobby. So down the street they go again. Donald exclaims, Oh, no. It's starting to rain. Suddenly Dewey exclaims, Hey! Remember that place we passed in the way in? Come on! They hurry down the street. And next morning, we see Huey, Louie, Dewey, and Donald sound asleep in the four dog houses they'd passed the night before. <laughs> Sleep in the dog houses. Yes, I bet you'd like to do that yourself. <laughs> well, if the dogs don't have fleas. Uh huh, I see what you mean. And I know a riddle. What's the difference between a flea and an elephant? Oh, tell me quickly. <laughs> an elephant can have fleas, but a flea can't have an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good. Now, how would you like to read Dick's adventures? Oh, I'd love to, because Dick is on an expedition in the early days of America exploring the Wild West. Yes, so let's go to the very last page of the first section. And now let's see what happens next on Dick's trip into the Northwest. Here we go with Dick's adventure. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventure to stick. Dick has awakened and has been telling his dad about his dream. And he's saying, Yeah, I dreamed. I dreamed I was with Lewis and Clark expedition, Dad. And we were almost at the Great Falls of Montana when... <laughs> Actually, I'm sleeping again. He falls to sleep and goes back and back. And once again is carried back in dreams to his place in the Lewis and Clark expedition. They finally reach the end of their journey on the river. For here is where the river ends. Last picture, top row. A cataract of water pouring down from its birthplace in the Rocky Mountains. And then, their attention is taken away from the river, the great wonder of nature, to a little wonder of nature, the Indian papoose. Oh, the baby needs milk. And by now, all the milk that had been brought along on the trip has been used up. Here is a problem indeed. No milk and a crying baby. The explorers scratch their heads, wondering where are they going to find fresh milk. And then Dick sees a short distance away a herd of buffalo. He sees some little calves. He knows that buffaloes are much like cows. Dick has an idea. And the idea is carried out. The men capture the shaggy buffalo mother and milk the mother cow. So, with first picture bottom row, with the problem of the baby's milk solved, the party returns to another problem. How to get their boats and supplies over the waterfall where the Missouri begins, about 16 miles of rapids and whirlpools. Everything has to be hauled overland. And what an overland. Dick stares at it. A wall of rocks and forest, 16 miles thick. <laughs> Wasn't that funny, yeah. milking a buffalo so the baby could have milk? Yeah. and I'll bet you that baby will grow up to be a strong one. Yes, because buffaloes are strong. Yes, I bet he'll grow up like a papa buffalo instead of a papa papoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, next week, we'll see how Dick and his friends get through the forest and around those rapids. That will be a lot of work. Oh, you bet it will. And now, look, underneath Dick's adventure. Oh, there's Rusty Riley. And I'll read him in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty.
Rusty and Pete have followed Sir Percival and Nobbs, who have stolen the valuables from the safe at the Milestone Farm. Pete has parked his car in the shade of a lean-to. And the boys watch as the two crooks go into an abandoned old house with their loot. Then first picture, Rusty says, They keep in the shadows, Pete. They're coming out of the abandoned house. But they haven't got the loot with them. Pete exclaims, Gosh, that means they've hidden it in there. Hey, we're in luck. And they duck back. Behind the lean-to, out of sight. Rusty says, Now wait till we hear him drive away, and then we'll go in. Pete says, Boy, will Mr. Miles be glad when we come back with those horse show trophies. Last picture, top row. Sir Percival is saying, It's pretty early, Nobby, but I'll drive into Lexington and get some breakfast. By that time, the car rental office should be open. And I'll return the car we hired. Nobbs replies, Sure, boss. And then you can take a bus back out here. Bring out some Jabba, will you? A moment later, hearing the car go down the road, Rusty says, first picture, bottom row. There they go, Pete. Come on. And the boys slip out of the darkness. They move carefully toward the old house. As they go in, Rusty says, th th This is the door they came out of. Pete exclaims, Jeepers, what a rickety, creepy old place. Meanwhile, at the Milestone Farm, the detective is giving Mr. Miles and Tex a report from the laboratory on the fingerprints. He's saying, Sorry, Mr. Miles, but the fingerprints on that pinch barn coal chisel are definitely Rusty Riley's. I've put out a general alarm to pick up the kids. Mr. Miles shakes his head slowly, saying, Oh, it's hard to believe, but I suppose the evidence is pretty conclusive. Yes, I know how you feel, sir. Anyhow, we'll soon have them. That hot rod won't be very hard to spot. That moment, Outside the abandoned house, Nobbs, who has been left behind, sees the tire tracks of Pete's car by the moonlight. He follows them. Last picture, he finds the car and exclaims, Well, now, what do you know? The kid's hot rod. He followed us, eh? <laughs> no doubt I got company in the house. Yes, those boys are in danger. I was hoping they'd get away all right. I wonder what'll happen now. Oh, and the detective found the fingerprints were Rusty's, too. Yes, but let's not worry too much. I know Tex will have faith in his friends. We'll find out more next week. Now let's pick up the first page of the second section. I have it right here. Oh, it's Dagwood and Blondie. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. ram a food, a fum zim zam zombie Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood is talking to Blondie on the phone. Hey, Blondie, I'm starved. Will you have an extra good supper for me when I get home tonight? And he goes on second picture. I'd like a steak smothered with onions, hash brown potatoes, and cream peas, and... Last picture, top row. Dagwood's boss comes up behind him and yells, Bumpstead, get your mind off your stomach and get to work. Oh, yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir. First picture next row, Blondie's at the store getting special vegetables to make Dagwood a yummy supper. Meanwhile, at the office, Dagwood now is so hungry, his tongue's hanging out. He looks at the clock and says, Oh, time goes so slowly when you're famished and waiting for supper time to come around. Dither sticks his head in the door and yells, Mom said, get to work. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. All the while at home, Blondie and Cookie are busy in the kitchen, fixing Dagwood the best dinner he ever had. And then, finally, next picture, third row. Dagwood gets off the bus and goes up the walk toward his house saying, Ah, home at last. Oh, joy. Oh, ecstasy. I can taste the steak already. At that moment... Two men are standing in his doorway. 
Uh, we're from the cleaners, Mr. Bumstead. Uh, we come to pick up your rug. Blondie points to the rug rolled up on the hall floor, then dashes back to the kitchen to get Dagwood's food on the table. The men shoulder the rug and come out the door just as Dagwood dashes up the steps. He runs smack into the rug. <laughs> and falls to the ground, unconscious. First picture, bottom row. The two men from the cleaners come in the door, carrying poor, unconscious Dagwood. Uh, where should we put him? Blondie tells him, in the kitchen. So the two men carry Dagwood out to the kitchen, where supper is on the table. They dump him in a chair and then hurry away. Half hour later, Blondie, Alexander, and Cookie have finished eating. Dagwood is still unconscious. They hold a juicy steak under Dagwood's nose, hoping the delicious smell will bring him to. Finally, Cookie says, It's no use, Mama. So they pick Dagwood up and carry him off to bed. And Dagwood groans, Supper was delicious, dear. <laughs> he, he didn't have one single bite. Well, he certainly was not silly, wasn't he? Yes, that's too bad. He was so hungry and Blondie went to so much trouble. Well, anyway, the dogs will have a good steak dinner. Yes. Oh, look, right here, here's Roy, under, Roy Rogers under Dagwood and Blondie. And you remember Roy had come to the logging camp because that cute little cowgirl had sent for him to come and help because she was in trouble. Yes, and when Roy got to the logging camp, he discovered that Wildwood's Aunt Pauline owned the logging camp and that there'd been an awful lot of accidents, strange accidents. And these accidents were preventing Aunt Pauline from delivering her logs to market. And just as Wildwood is explaining this to Roy, a tree that somebody was chopping down started to fall right toward Roy and Wildwood. Quick, Reed, I hope they don't get hurt by it. All right, here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo <laughs> As the tree falls, Roy spurs Trigger and grabs Wildwood, hoping to get out from under him. Roy gets out from under just in time. And then Pauline runs up and says, Wildwood, you're all right? It was really an accident this time, child. The knuckle-headed logger side the tree roll. Wildwood tells her she can thank Roy Rogers for seeing her and that he's here to help her deliver the timber to the sawmill on time. Last picture top row, Pauline says, Hmm... I don't know if a cowboy can do a good job on a lumber job, Roy, but my knees sold me on you. Well, I'll be glad to try investigating those accidents and the disappearance of your loggers, ma'am. At that moment, one of her workers on a rigging overhead calls. First picture, bottom row. Hey! I just saw that crazy timber wolf, old Cosmo, prowling around the coal deck of timber up on the ridge. And he's got an axe. What? Roy, for gosh sakes, get up there and grab that old pest. No telling what he's liable to do. Roy leaps on trigger and gallops up the hill. At the top of the hill, a man is chopping away at a stake that holds the log stacked up. And he's saying, I'll teach them loggers to ruin the forest. They'll destroy all the trees. That nature meant to live and breathe. I'll stop them. Suddenly the stake gives way, and the logs pour down the hill toward Roy. Hey, hey, what's going on? The crazy old man yells, So, you're another one coming to help him kill the trees, eh? Well, you won't live long enough to do it. <laughs> oh, how will Roy ever escape from those logs? They're rolling right at him, and they're a pile almost as big as a train. Yes, and Roy's on the side of the hill where Trigger can't move fast. Well, what's the matter with that crazy old man that he should do that? I don't know, but we'll find out next week if Roy gets away safely and catches the old man and stops him from any more of his crazy tricks. But now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, Flash Gordon. And a terrible thing happened last week. Flash was in the flood, and he was being attacked by a whip shark. That's a great, huge fish. Yes, you bet. And remember that Menta, the queen of Mars, had pushed Dale out of the airship, and Dale had fallen into the water, too. Yes, and then Link got in a fight with the pilot, and in the fight, the airship went out of control, and it went into the flood. I don't know how they can be saved. Well, let's read now and find out what happens next. Here we go with Flash Gordon. 
Rega rega doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic flags. <laughs> Falling out of control, Queen Manta's ray ship crashes into the flooded Martian canal near the spot where Flash and Dale are struggling in the clutch of a voracious whip shot. Young Link dives from the ship as it hits the water, working out a plan of action as he swims toward his embattled friend. Last picture top row, grabbing one of the shark's flailing whips, Link gives a mighty tug, distracting the monster long enough for Dale to free her arm and fire a neutron blast which scores a direct hit. First picture bottom row, the wounded sea beast crashes around wildly. One of its lunges tosses Menta from the sinking scout ship. In a twinkling, a powerful tentacle wraps itself around the struggling queen. A moment before, Menta was Flash's deadly foe, but now she's only a woman in dire peril. Flash dives repeatedly in an effort to save the queen. But the stricken shark has dragged her far below the surface. She's the victim of her own treachery. Last picture, the three Earth people and the pilot make their way to a jutting rock. Suddenly, there's a thunderous roar in the sky overhead. It's a Martian canal plane circling toward them. Is its mission rescue or revenge? I hope so, too. After all, Flash saved the city from being destroyed, so they should be grateful to him. Yes, they should be, but then still the queen was killed, so maybe they'll think that Flash did it. Yes, I know. There is that danger, but we'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.